you should show what this looks like as a carbonyl. Um, and we're not gonna, let's not go through the mechanism for that. Let's just show what this would look like as a carbonyl. Um, well, to help you with that, which of these two oxygens was the carbonyl oxygen? The O that was the Greco. And which of these oxygens was an alcohol? Remember that the way that you make hemiacetals is by having an alcohol attack a carbonyl. So which of the oxygens used to be the alcohol oxygen and which used to be the carbonyl? This one used to be... The alcohol. Yeah. This used to be alcohol. It doesn't look like an alcohol anymore, but that's because it depropinated after it attacked. We talked about that before. This could not have been the carbonyl because it has a carbon chain on the other side. A carbonyl oxygen wouldn't have a carbon chain on the other side. So I'm going to put the asterisk here. It's very helpful to asterisk, remember, the hidden carbonyl carbon and the hidden carbonyl oxygen. This looks like it might have used to have been a carbonyl oxygen that just got protonated. That's what usually happens to the carbonyl oxygens. They protonate. All right, so now we're going to have to draw what this looked like before it turned into a hemiacetal. That's not that easy. It might help to use some numbers and, and take your time there. Let's draw what this looked like before the alcohol attacked. Oh, you figured it out. Good. Now, in order to get this back into being a uh, aldehyde or ketone, I'm going to have to break a bond. I'm certainly not going to break this bond, because this is the carbonyl oxygen. This is the bond we should squiggle. Remember, this must be the bond that got formed when the alcohol attacked. Oh, and we do that by the H plus by adding a proton to the... If you were going to show the mechanism, maybe, maybe we should have gone through the mechanism for this, actually. Uh, maybe that will get more insight if we go through the mechanism here, although we should be able to do it without the mechanism, too. So. We can show this oxygen gaining the proton. And because it's an epoxide, it's going to want to break out. Right. Technically, it's not an epoxide because it's not a three membered ring, but it has right, a positive, yeah, charge. positive charge. Positive charge makes it a good leaving group. And at the same time, since we want to make this into a carbonyl anyway, we can show this oxygen kicking it off. Using numbers helps to make sure that we're not gaining the losing carbons. Isn't it a double bond? All right. That H just falls off by. It doesn't. Re H is never really just fall off. Call but people start to get lazy and make and pretend. Maybe one of these is going to take it off. Maybe this might take it off. Maybe the solvent might take it off. So they didn't really. Uh, whatever the conjugate base is here might take it off. If this came from sulfuric acid, then the sulfate could take it off. So um, I'll, I'll start doing okay. what the textbook does. And um, oftentimes textbooks make it seem like the proton is just falling off, even though there's always somebody who's taking it. All right. Um, so that gets us back to here, and we can see this really was a hidden carbonyl all the time. Now, it's important to be able to go through this mechanism, but you should also be able to get this intermediate without the mechanism. You should be able to do it both ways. Oh, uh, actually, I don't know. Maybe in this case, going through the mechanism was well worth it to see what's going on. But even without the mechanism, we should have been able to see this is the bond that we need to break to get back to the carbonyl, because this is the bond that would have been formed when the alcohol attacked the carbonyl. So if we're going to do the reverse, we should be breaking the bond from where the alcohol attacked the carbonyl. Uh, and then we're forming a new pi bond over here. So it's good to practice so that you can do this with or without the mechanism. Um, if, uh, if we're starting with this hemi the cyclic hemiacetal, when we go back to the hidden carbonyl, it's not cyclic anymore. 
This is actually a pretty uh, standard type of reaction. This is not that uh, not considered that exotic, so it's good that we're going over this. All right, so we've gotten back to our carbonyl over here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. And now we should be able to draw the product from this next step. And again, we shouldn't have to go through the whole mechanism for this. This should be a pretty standard next step now that we treat this with the hydrazine. Maybe you've done that already. Or not. Okay. That looks good. Whoops. How do we know this is going to be a category 3? Because it has two protons to lose. So it's going to lose both of its protons. This hydrogen still has a proton. By the way, what does the C6H5 mean? It's a phenylene. Yeah, so uh, you can save space by just writing it as phenyl. If you check it out, you'll see that a phenyl substituent what's has. What's the difference by benzene or phenyl? Uh, phenyl basically is benzene thought of as a substituent. So when benzene is a substituent, it's not called benzene Benzol. anymore. And for some strange reason, benzyl, you'll get into this later, this is considered benzyl when, you have a, when you're connected yeah. to a CH2 group. It's not really very logical, so. That's why I was confused. This will actually be important later in the course. This would be considered a phenyl substituent on the R, because we're directly connected to the benzene. But this is considered a benzyl substituent. It's not really logical. We just need to memorize that. Phenyl is when you're directly connected to the benzene. And benzyl is when you're connected to a CH2 that's connected to the benzene. This is almost the opposite of what might be logical. But anyway, this is the way the nomenclature has, has fallen out. That'll be important later in the course when you're studying benzene in more detail. So anyway, this is a phenyl substituent over here, C6H5. So it's a perfectly good shortcut to just write pH for phenyl. That can save us some time. Make sure you have the right number of hydrogens on your, nitro uh, on your nitrogens. This doesn't have any left. Um, and this is a typical, so this is a hydrazine derivative. A hydrazine derivative, so this would be considered a hydrazone derivative. All right, like I said, this is actually a pretty standard type of test question. The habit that we have to get into, you have to get into the habit of noticing hidden carbonyls. You have to get into the habit of noticing hidden carbon carbonyls in the reagents that you're given on the test. You have to look at the molecule and ask, are there any hidden carbonyls, any carbons with two bonds to electronegative atoms, especially two bonds to oxygen. That's one of the most classic types of hidden carbonyl. And if you have a starting material that has a hidden carbonyl, there's an excellent chance that you're supposed to reveal that carbonyl as part of the reaction. Here we had a starting material that had a hidden carbonyl, and we actually had to reveal the carbonyl as part of the reaction before we had an aldehyde for the hydrazine to attack over here. Um, so that's why this hidden carbonyl nomenclature is good. And then it was crucial to realize this was the hidden carbonyl oxygen, the one with the hydrogen. Yeah. And this is the one that came from the alcohol. Notice that this is an alcohol now down here. But after it attacks, it would lose a proton. It looked like this. So that's a good question to mark. We'll try it again. OK, good. That was a good set.